do not uh, F around and find out, okay? You will find out real quick. <laughs> that is not a move. Welcome back, everybody. Today is the fourth and final episode of the How Muscles Grow series. Let's do a quick review of what we've learned so far in the first three episodes. Skeletal muscle growth is going to start off with the resistance training paired with proper nutri nutrition. Once that is in place, there's an inflammatory response, an acute and localized inflammatory response in the muscle that you just trained that is going to signal for multiple anabolic pathways to turn on and repair and adapt that skeletal muscle. Following that inflammation, there's an activation of satellite cells. Satellite cells then undergo the myogenic lineage commitment, meaning that they commit towards turning into mature muscle cells. This is regulated through myogenic regulatory factors, MRFs, which are genes such as PAX7 and MyoG, as well as WNT slash FCD signaling, which comprises the canonical and multiple non-canonical WNT FCD signaling pathways. There's also the MAPK slash ERK cascade, which rapidly mechanotransduces that mechanical stimuli into biochemical pathways so that, and MAPK slash ERK is going to serve as a highway system almost for communication of the various biochemical signaling pathways. There is also mTOR, the P13K AKT mTOR pathway that is involved in the upregulation of muscle protein synthesis to pair that with the fusion and accretion of new myonuclei from satellite cells. As one continues to grow muscle with consistent training and nutrition, there is a diminishing returns effect from the training and the dieting that someone does. And that is largely due to things such as an increase in myostatin levels, which deters muscle growth through multiple different aspects, as well as a deteriorating inflammatory acute response that is necessary to turn on the whole process of muscle regeneration. Your body basically just gets used to the damage and doesn't treat it like it once did when it was first uh, during the newbie gain phase. We also discussed the importance of hormones, IGF-1 to name one, also testosterone and estrogen in the male body. There is much more circulating testosterone, uh, particularly the free testosterone that is unbound by SHBG and albumin. And the difference in androgen and estrogen levels is largely what did take, dictates the body composition differences between men and women. Testosterone signals through primarily the androgen receptor for genomic pathways, for genomic manipulation of upwards of 30,000 different androgen receptor target genes. And those genes is where the discrepancy and lack of understanding in research so far is regarding the androgen signaling pathway. But in general, Androgen receptor agonism in skeletal muscle mass increases the hypertrophic response of skeletal muscle mass, whether you have resistance training or not. Now, even with performance enhancing drugs, one will eventually re reach a stagnation in muscle growth. And that is most likely going to be attributed to the uh, upregulation of myostatin levels, specifically the basal level of myostatin that initially seems to fall to allow some level of adaptation, but then once you reach a certain point, it starts to kick back up and prevents you from getting too big. I should also mention that there is a non-genomic mechanism of testosterone and other steroid hormones. Like, uh, like we said before, the steroid hormones, cortisol, testosterone, estrogen, mineral corticoids, they all have that similar steroid structure core, which enables them to fit into each other's receptors. Not always, but oftentimes they do have some interaction. Some androgens, DHT derived, especially like Mastron and Anivar, may function as almost an anti-estrogen, an antagonist of the estrogen receptor, whereas the estrogen estrogens circulating in your body might fit and 
partially agonize the mineral corticoid receptor, and perhaps that explains why aromatizable anabolic steroids, such as testosterone, is associated with increased water retention compared to dry steroids, cutting steroids that don't convert into estrogen. That leaves the most inter interesting part for today's discussion. I'm very excited to finally be able to lay out all the major findings of my research so far, because now you guys finally have a general understanding on step-by-step -step how muscle grows. It's not just it's so much more complex than you go to the gym, you break down your muscle fibers and they grow back stronger. There's so many biochemical pathways, genes that are involved in this whole thing. And I think it's very important to understand that before we dive into the death of performance enhancing drugs, which is another variable upon the many variables already in place. The first topic of today is the divisions of anabolic androgenic steroids. Testosterone is regarded widely as the first performance enhancing drug. But as we mentioned before, testosterone lacks tissue selectivity, especially up at the higher end of the doses, because if you are running a gram or two grams of testosterone a week exogenously, which is like a hundred times more than what your natural body produces, then a lot of that is, yes, is going to agonize the androgen receptor at the skeletal muscle level, but also it's going to affect androgen receptors in the liver, in your brain, might make you a little bit more irritable. A lot of that free testosterone is going to be converted into DHT. And then for those with high 5-alpha reductase activity in their body can lead to androgenic side effects like prostate growth, hair loss, voice deepening in women. The aromatization of testosterone can lead to bloating, water retention, gynecomastia in men, which is one of the greatest fears of male bodybuilders is developing permanent gynecomastia, which pretty much the only way that you can get rid of that is through surgery to remove that gland. Testosterone has been around for almost 100 years at this point. And to try to isolate the beneficial anabolic effects on skeletal muscle of testosterone from the unwanted androgenic or aromatizable side effects, the health complications of testosterone, researchers developed different androgens that are analogs of testosterone or of DHT or of 19 nor testosterone. And as we mentioned before, these anabolic steroids, these androgens generally have 19 carbons. A 19 nor testosterone is missing the 19th carbon and it's replaced with something else to give it a certain effect in the body. The general reason for all of these manipulations on the structure of androgens is to improve the tissue selectivity to give the steroid a certain effect. DHT levels are not very high for most people in skeletal muscle because it's rapidly degraded into 3-alpha-diol, a relatively bio-inactive androgen. DHT is not a very potent anabolic agent. It's not going to cause a whole lot of muscle growth, even if you administered it exogenously. But if you change the structure of that DHT molecule, in a particular way, then you can get an anabolic steroid such as primobolin or anavar or masteron or winstrol. So these are all derived from that DHT steroid. How do you know that? By looking at the structure. As we mentioned before, the DHT is, testosterone is turned into DHT by the reduction of the bond, of the double bond between the fourth and fifth carbon atom. So all DHT-derived steroids, anabolic steroids, have a reduction in that double bind of the fourth and fifth carbon. As far as testosterone-derived ones, testosterone-derived anabolic and androgenic steroids, these are things like equipoise or dianabol. With 19-nor-derived androgens, that's like steroids such as trenbolone or DECA, which is also technically nandrolone or check drops and trestolone. Those are all 19-nor 
derived. They are all derived from nandrolone, except for nandrolone, which is just the parent compound itself. Each drug in each class has a unique effect. And part of that reason is because of their unique interaction with endogenous enzymes. For instance, in the DHT category, these drugs are already 5-alpha reduced. So they do not they do not fit as a substrate for the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. Whereas something in the testosterone category, generally, these are able to be aromatized because of the delta 4-3 keto configuration that they all maintain. And that's why we have things like a test base in a steroid cycle so that you're maintaining your physiological balance of testosterone to estrogens to DHT. And that's very important in things like maintaining your cholesterol, or at least as, be as best as you can while you're running gear, and sex drive and cognitive function. These are all things that rely on the balance of estrogens, testosterone, and DHT. So the best one in that category of testosterone to run as a test base is for most people going to be testosterone itself because it's bioidentical. Your body knows exactly what to do with it. Your body knows that in the morning you have a peak in testosterone and perhaps that is why some TRT users argue that you should do you should pin yourself with a small amount of testosterone that best fits that most closely resembles the circadian rhythm the diurnal pattern of testosterone of a spike in the morning and then slowly gradually down towards the lower end as the night progresses and then another spike the next morning and another spike um but anyways yeah dht derived steroids they cannot be five alpha reduced they are already in that 5-alpha reduced form. Something like testosterone-derived steroid like equipoise, boldenone, can be DHT, uh, can be converted into its dihydro version called dihydroboldenone, DHB. As far as the nandrolone category, these are unique because these are, these have a progestonic activity. And this goes back to that steroid cross-reactivity where an androgen can block the action of the cortisol receptor or uh, an androgen can block the action of an estrogen receptor. 19 nor androgens, test, uh, trenbolone, nandrolone, trestolone, check drops, they have progestonic activity, meaning that they are going to cause some agonism of the progesterone receptor which is progesterone is one of the female hormones. It's one of the important anabolic hormones for females. That has a whole unique array of effects. Progesterone is probably one of the most suppressive milligram per milligram compared to an androgen or an estrogen. And anecdotally, that is seen because people that are running trenbolone are unable to maintain their testicular size, even if they're using a synthetic LH or FSH analog, such as HCG, a part of a post-cycle therapy PCT drug that people use to revive their HPG axis. So it might work for a testosterone-only cycle because testosterone is suppressive to the HPG axis, but not nearly as suppressive as progesterone-based androgens. So that is why progesterone-based androgens, such as Trembolone and DECA, they're very, very hard to come back from after your natural testosterone suppression has been suppressed. For those pursuing a career in professional bodybuilding, I've mentioned this in uh, a recent video, the first pill you're gonna swallow is you're going to be on TRT for the rest of your life. Perhaps in the future, there's scientific breakthroughs that can fix that, but don't bet on it. You need to simply accept the fact that after decades of cycling steroids and you're not ever going to ever come off completely. You might come back to like a cruise, a bodybuilder TRT of 200 to maybe 300, 400 milligrams of testosterone only a week. And then during the blast phase, four months out from the competition, you just do <laughs> like five to 10 grams a year and growth hormone, everything. But when you're doing that for years and years and years, even if you're blasting and cruising, and you're never coming off, don't expect your 
HPG axis to come back to its full potential, to its original function, even with the greatest PCT protocol of all time. So these anabolic androgenic steroids can generally fit into one of three categories, the DHT derived, the testosterone derived, the 19 nor nandrolone derived. And they're in these families, but these, are, these families are, the lines between these families are not sharp. And what I mean by that is just because a steroid is part of the DHT family, it doesn't mean it's going to act very similarly to all other DHT steroids. I mean, just look at the difference between Trenbolone and Nandrolone. These are both 19 nor steroids. One of them puts on a whole bunch of water weight on you, Nandrolone, and has beneficial effects on the joints and collagen production. While the other, Trenbolone, almost has the opposite effect of shrink toning, shrink wrapping your skin and depleting you of glycogen, giving that you look like you look like you're on keto diet kind of thing. And even though they're both 19 nor steroids, right? Even the enzymatic activity, nandrolone can be converted via the 5 alpha reductase enzyme into dihydronandrolone, which is actually a weaker androgen than nandrolone itself. But trembolone. If you look at the structure of trembolone, even though it's a 19 nor steroid and it's derived from nandrolone, it cannot undergo that enzymatic conversion to something called dihydrotrembolone, dihydrotrembolone, which isn't even a thing. And trembolone is also special because if you look at the structure of trembolone, it's extremely stable, very, very stable. And I hypothesize that one of the reasons why Trembolone, even if you're injecting the trembolone, it's liver toxic. Your liver enzymes generally tend to elevate from trembolone is because it's so stable that your liver has to work really hard to break it down, even if you're injecting it so that you're not undergoing that initial hepatic first pass of most oral steroids. But even though you're not swallowing this trembolone pill, well, you could with check drops, which is methyl trembolone. Um, but that would be really, really harsh on the liver. So definitely stay away from check drops. I don't think the benefit to risk ratio is worth it for anybody, even at the Olympia level. Just use more trembolone, if anything, compared to check drops. That leads me to talk about something called the anabolic to androgenic ratio. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard, oh, testosterone has an anabolic androgenic ratio of one to one, or some people say two to one. And nandrolone has an anabolic androgenic ratio of 11 to 1. Generally, this ratio is supposed to measure the tissue selectivity of an anabolic androgenic steroid. So most people, when they're using these compounds, they want skeletal muscle hypertrophy. They do not want enlargement of the prostate, men, right? They do not want enlargement of the prostate, especially after years and years of abuse. But they want as much muscle growth as they can out of these compounds. How do we assess with a, an objective measure, a numerical value, how tissue selective something is? That's where the anabolic to energetic ratio comes in. So it was first proposed in 1950 by Eisenberg and Gordon, and they assessed this bioassay to represent the anabolic effect of a anabolic steroid compared to its androgenic effect. What they do is they use these castrated male rats. They castrate them because they want to standardize the androgen, androgen level in them with the synthetic drugs. And the levator ani, which is a, a muscle that rats have, was used to model the anabolic effect of anabolic steroids, such as the skeletal muscle effects. And the seminal vesicles was used to demonstrate or model after the androgenic effects of an applied androgen. So in human beings, this would be similar to if you were to take an anabolic compound, how much skeletal muscle growth would you have compared to how much prostate growth would you have? And they're using levator ani for that skeletal muscle demonstration and seminal vesicles for that prostate or androgenic tissue demonstration. So you might imagine that 
the more tissue selective an anabolic androgenic steroid is, the higher that ratio of anabolic to androgenic is going to be. The higher amount of skeletal muscle hypertrophy, or in this model, the higher weight gain in levator ani compared to the prostate growth or the seminal vesicles of these rats that they used. This was used to calculate the anabolic androgenic ratio of multiple anabolic steroids. And generally, it is accepted that testosterone is the standardized default value of one to one anabolic to androgenic because it's not very, it's not tissue selective. What factors are involved in determining what factors are going to affect this anabolic to androgenic ratio? Well, how does a compound interact with the endogenous enzyme, specifically 5-alpha reductase enzyme? Because as we mentioned before, the 5-alpha reductase expression is higher in androgenic tissues. And of course, genetics dictates that. But in general, in men, 5-alpha reductase expression is high in the scalp, in the reproductive organs, and so on. While in skeletal muscle tissue, 5-alpha reduction, 5-alpha reductase expression is generally a lot lower. If you look at a compound like nandrolone, that is 5-alpha reduced into dihydronandrolone. Now think about it, in an androgenic tissue like the scalp of a man with high 5-alpha reductase activity, if you are taking nandrolone exogenously, once that nandrolone reaches the scalp, then it's gonna be reduced into dihydronandrolone. And dihydronandrolone is a weaker androgen, meaning it binds to the androgen receptor with weaker affinity and causes a weaker level of androgen signaling than the parent hormone, which is nandrolone. Therefore, the final outcome of that is an improved tissue selectivity as far as the scalp goes, right? And also, in you could extrapolate that to the male reproductive organs, which also are gonna have that high fat alpha reductase activity. So nandrolone is going to be turned into dihydronandrolone, and you would actually have less androgenic signaling there than perhaps even if you weren't taking any drugs at all and just your natural testosterone production was your only means of androgen signaling. With something like a DHT derived, these, the, these anabolic steroids are unable to undergo the 5-alpha reductase because they already have been 5-alpha reduced. Therefore, they have not as of a higher anabolic to androgenic ratio because with nandrolone, 5-alpha reduction would make the androgen weaker. With dihydrotestosterone, DHT-derived anabolic androgenic steroids, they don't have that option to be converted into a stronger or weaker one. Testosterone is converted into a stronger androgen by 5 alpha reductase. If anabolic to androgenic ratio measured by this assay of the levator ani to the seminal vesicles or the prostate was all that really mattered, then why do you see these top level pros using a little bit of everything depending on, of course, the time of the season. Are they pre-contest or off-season? Because if anabolic to androgenic ratio was the only thing that mattered, then you would just choose the one with the highest anabolic androgenic ratio. I mean, SARMs, some of the SARMs have apparently an anabolic androgenic ratio of 500 to 1, which blows any anabolic steroid out of the way. But you don't see top Mr. Olympia guys preaching about, oh, high-dose SARMs, bro, like, that's how I got all these gains. No, they're using high levels of anabolic androgenic steroids. And that's because the anabolic androgenic ratio is just one metric, okay? Human beings have this tendency to just make everything black or white, yes or no, turn everything into a numerical value. In school, they like to judge how smart you are on your GPA or your SAT score. It's a numerical value. They like to turn things that are inherently subjective into an objective score so that they can judge you on the spot really fast. Same thing with the steroids, right? They are trying to just put a number, or in this case, a quotient, to these anabolic steroids and say, this one is the best. And you can't argue with me because this is an objective number. 19 is higher than 15. 10 is higher than 1. An anabolic energetic ratio of 11 to 1 is always going to be better than an anabolic energetic ratio of 1 to 1. Well then, how come we see 
we see clearly that this is not the case when it comes to practical application. People don't just go for DECA-only cycles because that alone has so many side effects, such as your uh, libido not working properly or just being depressed, not caring about anything. Some people get it, some people don't. So what I'm really trying to show here is the anabolic androgenic ratio is just one metric to consider. And you need to consider that each of these anabolic androgenic steroids, regardless of their family, just each one has a specific effect once they confine to the androgen receptor and that conformational change happens. Each one of these has a unique conformational change of that receptor ligand complex going to the nucleus, and then it's going to initiate different target genes in different ways, right? One might have a higher ability to induce IGF-1, right? But another one might have antagonism effects on the glucocorticoid receptor better than another one. So that's why you see bodybuilders stacking these compounds. The, the conclusion of last uh, episode's video was we want to get as much benefits, as much skeletal muscle hypertrophy with as least amount of side effects. And when you're pushing it to the absolute limits, it seems that the best way to approach that is to milk the synergistic effects, okay? With a DECA-only cycle, one of the reasons it's riddled with side effects like a lack of libido or depression is because you are not filling in that physiological need of testosterone, estrogen, DHT that your body relies on. By having a test base, and some people say a one-to-one -one is good or a two-to-one test to DECA is good to prevent these side effects, you are ameliorating each other's side effects. The DHT or the DECA, the nandrolone, is going to provide a very good anabolic effect. It has an anabolic androgenic ratio of 11 to 1. And in the prostate, or the scalp, it might even have an inhibitory action on the androgen action and in the androgen signaling. But testosterone that you're taking, it might not be as tissue selective as DECA, but at least it's fulfilling the need for your CNS to function properly so that you have a normal libido and normal state of mind so that you're not depressed, right? So each of these has benefits, each of these has side effects, but the benefits of each one are also able to kind of ameliorate each other's side effect, okay? That's just talking about two steroids, testosterone and DECA. It gets really complex when you are talking about taking five, 10 drugs at a time at the same time. Each one has their own unique effects, and then you're gonna have to probably take something else to ameliorate the side effects of one, okay? As you guys probably know, Anabolic androgenic steroids are generally taken intramuscularly through an injection. And of course, that has led to negative stigma and people shying away from it because they don't want to have to pin themselves. It's really shady and such. But there's a reason for that. And that's because you can't just swallow these as a pill, as at least not until recently due to new, uh, new research, new technology. And that is because when you consume something orally, it is subject to hepatic first pass metabolism. And these are lipophilic and fragile substances in general. Hence, we have things like SHBG and albumin to maintain their bioavailability and serum concentration within the plasma. If you were to take androgens without any modification orally, you would, first of all, there's two main problems. The liver would rapidly degrade almost all of that androgen into inactive keto metabolites. And even if you bypass that, even if you had a intramuscular injection, you would just have a spike in levels of that androgen and then drastically come down. Now, sometimes we do want that, like a pre-workout androgen testosterone suspension, for example, is pure testosterone in something like water. It doesn't have any esters attached so that it's a rapid spike when you need it, the aggression, the drive, 
the energy, the pump that you need when you're getting an aggressive, aggressive workout at the gym. But is that the best way to go about maximal amount of muscle protein synthesis throughout the whole day? Probably not. And that's where we have esterification, specifically 17 beta esterification, and that's esterification of the 17th carbon of androgens generally, is that's where we put, <clears throat> we attach these esters such as acetate, like trenbolone acetate, or cypionate, testosterone cypionate, or deca, decadurabolin. We attach a decanoate acid to the 17th carbon of nandrolone. Each of these are different carbon links. The longer the carbon link, the longer the half-life, because once you inject an anabolic androgenic steroid with a 17 beta esterification into your plasma, the drug, the active drug of that steroid is released slowly as your body hydrolyzes that ester as you break off the carbon chains. So that is a way to sustain and stabilize the bioavailability as well as the corresponding bioactivity of an anabolic androgenic steroid that is injected. Now with oral steroids, generally the old school thought is they don't really have a ester attached generally. So it is kind of like that spike every time you take it. But because you are taking it orally, that's going to first of all suppress that spike, but also lengthen it. And it's more of a gradual rise and fall, but still it's it's pretty choppy. It's up and down, up and down every time you take it. So the old school method of taking oral steroids was something like three to four times split apart throughout the day so that you maintain as steer, a stable serum concentration as best as possible. Now the new age of thinking thought is to take these oral steroids um, <clears throat> just pre-workout, just one time a high dose so that it's similar to that testosterone suspension in that spike when you need it and then it comes back down but not all the way down because you still have a background anabolic of, let's say, testosterone injected uh, twice a week or something. Examples of 17-alpha alkylated oral steroids are things like dianabol. And what they're doing is they're alkylating, they're attaching a methyl group or an ethyl group to the 17th carbon of the androgen. What that does is it allows a lot of that steroid to, much more than if you didn't do this, to survive first pass in hepatic metabolism. But at the same time, that very modification is what causes most of these oral steroids to be liver toxic, with the exception of Anivar, which has a, uh, I believe an oxygen group at the fifth carbon, allowing it to be metabolized differently through the kidneys primarily. But that is the reason why these oral steroids, they're very convenient. You can just pop a pill. You don't have to pin yourself every time, but they come with a drawback that they're generally liver toxic and they also lack bioavailability. Even with that modification, it's not gonna be 100%, nowhere near 100%. And also because they have to take it multiple times to maintain a stable serum concentration. But don't stop, there's more. Because something like anadrol is generally classified as a DHT-derived anabolic androgenic steroid, and it is liver toxic. It is a 17-alpha alkylated oral steroid. But that hepatic metabolism might not always be bad because if you were to take something like testosterone orally without any modification to it, yes, it would be degraded into inactive keto metabolites, mostly. But something like anadrol, there is anecdotal evidence, at least, and also a little bit of clinical evidence, but not necessarily in humans, that the hepatic, the first pass hepatic metabolism of anadrol leads to bioactive metabolites, perhaps over 50 different bioactive metabolites, and at least a good portion of those are very effective at drastically increasing your strength. Just ask your local power lifter. Their top two go-to steroids for instant strength is probably Anadrol 50 and Trenbolone. Those two are extremely 
extremely effective for increasing strength on the go. So yes, there is, and there probably is an estrogenic or mineral corticoid agonizing metabolite of anadrol as well, because anadrol tends to make people swell up really fast with water weight, which is helpful for that strength in the gym as well. We have covered how anabolic androgenic steroids work. All of these are gonna work genomically, at least through the androgen receptor and lead to the upregulation or downregulation of certain androgen target genes. And each of them are unique in doing so because they have a different gene profile, most likely. They also have perhaps unique effects on how they are metabolized by endogenous enzymes. Some of them have longer half-lives than others, some of them are degraded much faster than others, and so on. Some of them are aromatized, some of them are 5-alpha reduced. But even with these development of new anabolic androgenic steroids that do have far superior tissue selectivity than testosterone, the original anabolic steroid, there is still a limitation. And that limitation appears to be the actual steroid backbone of the anabolic steroids, that every single one of these has that steroid core backbone. And the steric core is very rigid. And when it's binding to the androgen receptor to cause a conformational change and lead to a unique receptor ligand complex, that steric core being so rigid as it is appears to be a major limitation in pursuing even more optimized tissue selectivity. This is where non-steroidal SARMs come in. Most people just abbreviate to SARMs. And I'm talking about things like RAD140, LGD4033, LGD3033, Osterine, S4, S23. The new one that starts with AC something. Um, these things are non-steroidal and also generally polar, whereas anabolic and androgenic steroids were lipid derived. They're all derived from cholesterol and testosterone, which is derived from cholesterol. These are more polar. And because of that, they first of all, they lack that steric rigid core that inhibits a certain conformation that might be more optimal for tissue selectivity. Because if you think about it, if you didn't have such a rigid steric core, then you have more variables to work with. You have more degrees of freedom to optimize the structure and the resulting ligand receptor complex so that you could achieve a better tissue selective response. These SARMs, selective androgen receptor modulators, are just that. They selectively modulate, they either agonize or antagonize the androgen receptor and perhaps agonize or antagonize certain target genes that are involved with androgen signaling, depending on the tissue that they are in. It's quite interesting, actually. If you look at something like RAD140, these SARMs generally do not interact with the enzymes that anabolic androgenic steroids interact with, like 5-alpha reductase and aromatase. And so they are very targeted to the androgen receptor and the androgen receptor only. And where is the androgen receptor? Very, it's very ubiquitous throughout the whole body. We have it in the scalp, we have it in the skin, we have it in the muscle, we have it in the bone. Um, the point of these SARMs was to develop an alternative. It's, it could be thought of as the next of kin to anabolic steroids because they are working through the androgen receptor, but they're different in the fact that they're not steroidal in nature. So they are technically not steroids. If you are on SARMs, you could, you could 100% with honesty look at someone in the eye and say, I am not on steroids because you, it's not a steroid at all. It's not lipophilic. It is polar. It's a polar hydrophilic substance. How do these SARMs work? And since SARMs are so new in comparison to anabolic androgenic steroids and very, very limited in the human research aspect, the exact mechanism of SARMs is not very well understood. But there is some general agreement 
that the non-steroidal nature of SARMs, as I mentioned before, is a major contributing factor as to why they are able to achieve such amazing tissue selectivity. And even though the anabolic androgenic ratio is, of course, not everything when it comes to tissue selectivity, we're talking about tissue selectivity that is 90 to 1 or 500 to 1. Um, so non-steroidal SARMs, they can be designed to induce a specific conformational change to the ligand ligand domain in the androgen receptor. They're also going to promote NC terminal interaction. That's two domains of the androgen receptor that need to interact in general for full activation of the androgen receptor. And they can also modulate the surface topology, the shape and thermodynamic partitioning, as well as alter the protein to protein interaction between the androgen receptor and co-regulators, so that's transcription factors and ultimately yield, yield a tissue specific gene regulation. So what does that mean? There is this thing called the co-regulator hypothesis. So when a ligand binds to the receptor and it's inducing those conformational changes, getting ready to go to the DNA and bind to it, there's actually also a recruitment of co-regulators. And these can be uh, things that enhance that agonism, such as a co-activator or a co-repressor. Examples of these include nuclear receptor co-repressor, N-COR, or steroid receptor co-activator 1, SRC1. If we look at a study the, in the LNCAP cells, DHT, dihydrotestosterone, was used as a model for steroidal androgens. DHT recruits SRC, the co-activator, but not nuclear receptor co-repressor, NCOR, in the prostate-specific antigen receptor or enhancer site of the LNCAP cells. So the overall effect of that is in this androgenic model that they have of the prostate with the LNCAP prostate-specific antigen enhancer site of that LNCAP cells, DHT is acting as an overall strong agonist because it's recruiting the conformational change, the overall resulting conformation of that complex of the DHT to the antigen receptor is recruiting the co-activator, which was SRC1, but not the co-repressor. And this explains why there's a limitation to the tissue selectivity of testosterone, which is inevitably going to be turned into DHT by reductase in androgenic tissues and cause the growth and development and maybe overdevelopment of those masculine and androgenic tissues, the thing that we don't want. But on the other hand, an aryl propionide derived SARM, I believe it was, I think that was RAD140, uh, not 100% not sure, but one of the non-steroidal SARMs in the exact same model of the PSA enhancer site of LNCAP cells is able to recruit both the SRC1 and NCOR, both the co-activator and the co-repressors that they're looking at. So the overall effect of that, that SARM, the non-steroidal SARM, was a weak agonism of the androgenic tissue model, acting as a partial agonist, if you will, compared to DHT, which was a very strong agonist in the androgenic tissue. But in the skeletal muscle model, the SARM acts as, the non-steroidal SARM, acts as a full agonist of the androgen receptor due to this recruitment of the co-activator. But in the androgenic tissue, when you compare it, it's acting as a overall very weak uh, androgen. This hypothesis is called the co-activator hypothesis. And this is probably at this point the most well understood and most widely accepted hypothesis as to the mechanism of action of SARMs. It's the difference in the co-regulator recruitment. And that allows a specific and highly malleable complex, receptor ligand complex that can go into the DNA and 
specifically induce androgen receptor target genes as you wish, or at least as best as possible compared to anabolic androgenic steroids. Why do we see, do we generally not see the top level competitors in this sport using SARMs instead of steroids? Because in the study that I just mentioned, that is amazing. It is acting as super tissue selective and acting as a full agonist, much like other anabolic androgenic steroids, which just act as a full agonist in all tissues, pretty much. Whereas the SARM was able to differentiate the androgenic tissues and the anabolic tissues. Well, it's a risk to reward drawback kind of ratio. With SARMs, the, they, are, they are tissue selective compared to anabolic androgenic steroids. And work through the androgen receptor primarily, very, very highly, primarily only through the androgen receptor, at least in the current research so far. With anabolic androgenic steroids, part of the side effects that come with anabolic androgenic steroids, like water retention or gynecomastia, is because a lot of them are interacting with more than just the androgen receptor, whether it's through enzymatic metabolism or just directly like the progesterone agonism through the 19 nor steroids. And that's where a lot of the side effects of the anabolic androgenic steroids come from is that lack of being able to target just the androgen receptor in the skeletal muscle. But at the same time, that is partially the reason why anabolic androgenic steroids are able to give people more gains at the maximal tolerated dose than SARMs. Compare someone taking the higher end of the dose of RAD140, like 40 milligrams orally per day, compared to someone taking the higher end of testosterone, like a gram or two grams per week, you would not, the, the gains would be not even comparable. The testosterone person would be just blowing them out of the water. And a lot of that reason is because the side effects of testosterone, such as the estrogenic side effects, are actually associated with gains as well. Um, as we mentioned before, estrogen is very important for signaling through the uh, IGF-1 pathway. And if you are suppressing your testosterone with using a SARM, and yes, they do suppress testosterone, and I'll explain to that right after this on why and how they do that, you are actually lowering your endogenous levels of estrogen and testosterone and DHT in your levels if you're not using a test base. And then you are just working through the androgen receptor. You have high androgen signaling, but a lack of estrogen or DHT signaling. So testosterone is going to be bioconverted into estrogens, which is going to help with the IGF-1 response, better insulin sensitivity, better pumps, just feel good. Uh, it's also going to help with DHT, and that's important. Yes, it can cause hair loss, it can cause acne, but it can also help the CNS function so that you're able to recruit more muscle fibers, that muscle-mind connection, that strength of like activating all your muscle fibers, that aggression in the gym of maxing out on the last rep. Uh, your libido is going to be high as well. And um, it's going to make you look dry and just harden up the muscle and just make you more contracting. So it's a drawback, yes, but it's, it's a, it's a trade-off actually. The testosterone and even these other androgens that are anabolic androgenic steroids, they have better, they have a more broad spectrum effect. And that is why they are going to cause more gains, but also come with higher risk of side effects. Now, let's get into our SARMs suppressive. If I do a, if I do a, SARM only cycle, will I need to get a test base? Will I need to do PCT after? Okay, so the answer to that is it depends on the SARM, it depends on the person. SARMs are non-steroidal. They are polar in structure. And that is the reason why they are so orally bioavailable. Some of these SARMs have oral bioavailability of 40% or better, which is pretty good, way better than uh, anabolic steroids that are not 17 alpha alkylated and they get into the body and they don't they're not going to get bound to shbg they might get bound to albumin a little bit but in general they're they're in and they're out and they're into the tissues 
uh, very effectively. However, there is a trade-off. What being polar means is, so if you have a cell, the membrane is made of phospholipids. And the hydrophilic parts, the part that love water, are on the outside. The outside and the inside of the cell. The center of that hydrophilic uh, phospholipid bilayer is hydrophobic, right? This is where the cell is sort of fatty. For substances to easily pass through cells, generally we want a smaller compound and we want something that's non-polar, something like an anabolic androgenic steroids, which is as long as it's not bound to SHBG or albumin, it can easily slip into the cell, easily slip into the nucleus membrane and into the DNA and just start going away at the androgen receptor. With SARMs, they're polar, so they're gonna have a harder time, first of all, getting into the cell, okay? But that could be or could not be a bad thing. You see, the HPG axis is regulating the endogenous production of natural testosterone. And there's this thing called the blood-brain barrier, which is made of cells, okay? And very similarly to that cell membrane, in general, lipophilic substances like anabolic androgenic steroids can easily pass that and while polar substances like a lot of SARMs are going to have a more difficult time passing that and I believe that the reason why SARMs are non-steroidal SARMs are less suppressive than lipophilic androgens like testosterone and other anabolic steroids is because first of all, they're having a harder time getting through to that HPG axis. And once they, if they do break through, then you're going to have uh, an effect such as aggression, which is one of the effects of androgens in the brain is aggression, irritability, CNS stimulation. So in general, like almost all of these androgens, with the exception of very few of them, that because of the 5-alpha reductase of like di dihydronandrolone, um, they're going to all pretty much pass through that blood-brain barrier, reach the hypothalamus, and cause downregulation of the whole HPG axis and shut you off very, very hard, very suppressive. SARMs are polar, so they're going to have a much harder time getting through to that blood-brain barrier. And therefore, SARMs are not as associated with suppression, not as strongly associated with suppression or aggression. If we look at, even amongst the SARMs, there's a different varying levels of suppression. RAD140 and S23 are known to be generally the most suppressive SARMs, while LGD and Osterine are much less suppressive. And it's not like, if you're especially comparing like RID140 and LGD, it's not like one of them is way stronger than the other, milligram for milligram. RID140 is much more suppressive than LGD in general. And at the same time, coincidentally, this is probably not just a coincidence, RID140 is much more associated with aggression and irritability than LGD. That probably has something to do with the fact that even though all of these are polar, all of these SARMs are polar, RAD140 is probably able to pass that barrier of the blood-brain barrier much more easily than LGD because it's probably less polar than LGD or just a smaller molecule. And once it's in the hypothalamic region or the brain region, it induces androgen signaling, causing that irritability, um, as well as hair loss. I mean, that scalp is like right up here. So that is... The reason why some SARMs are more suppressive than others. But in general, it also explains why SARMs milligram for milligram are much less suppressive than analog androgenic steroids. Uh, to answer those two questions, do I need to PCT for SARM only cycles? If you are doing RAD140, yeah, probably. Oh, this is for men only. Um, if you are doing S23 or RAD140, then yes, almost 100% you will need a PCT. Maybe not a full-on PCT, but at least something like Novadex or something. 
if you are doing a low dose of LGD only, or Austerin, or S4, I think most people can get away with not doing a PCT. But it's always a good idea to keep an anti-estrogen on hand. Anti-estrogens are not good for your health, but it's always a good idea to at least have it on hand just in case, because you don't want to be that guy that is, the hormones are completely going out of whack because you just came off cycle and then you are panicking because you're developing gyno and bloating up and moody and depression because your estrogen is high and your androgens are low. So don't want to be that guy. Number one thing, first thing, before you pin anything that is going to suppress you, have an anti-estrogen on, on hand. And if you're going to need a PCT for it, get the PCT in your hands, not on the way through the mail, in your hands before you pin or take the drug. Do not, do not uh, F around and find out, okay? You will find out real quick. <laughs> that, that is not a move. Um, yeah, okay. So now, yes, yes, yes. We will talk about myostatin inhibitor. Myostatin is the number one well-known negative regulator of skeletal muscle mass. So inhibiting myostatin is going to lead to an inhibition of the inhibitor of muscle mass and ultimately skeletal muscle hypertrophy. In the previous episodes, I covered the mechanism of action of myostatin it is going to interact with type 1 and type 2 receptors, the ALK45, the act activin receptor type 2B, and so on. So two injections of a modified soluble activin R2B receptor in mice were, was able to increase skeletal muscle mass, and this is in a two-week period, by 40 to 60%. In a two week period that is amazing that is like you going from a hundred pounds to a hundred and forty pounds in two weeks 100 percent lean lean gains that is amazing um synthetic myostatin propeptides have been able to increase skeletal muscle mass by 25 to 30 percent so also still that's that blows any steroid out of the, out of the water one of the Negative regulators of myostatin that we discussed was folistatin. Folistatin was originally given its name because of its ability to inhibit the release of follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, but then it was found out later that it has a very potent inhibitory effect on TGF beta proteins, including myostatin. So people do take folistatin upregulating substances to inhibit myostatin. One of the examples is YK11, which is by structure, technically a DHT derived agonist of the androgen receptor. Interestingly, this is a gene selective agonist, although I'm not really sure why you would call that that, because technically all anabolic androgenic steroids and SARMs and androgen receptors, they all have that unique configuration that's gonna lead to specific and unique gene transcription. But at any rate, since folistatin and myostatin are known as androgen receptive genes, the way in which YK11 works is it upregulates the expression of folistatin through the androgen receptor. At least that is what is understood at this current point. And that in turn drastically reduces myostatin in the body and other TGF proteins, allowing you to grow beyond your potential, even with drugs. Yep. Interestingly, YK11 prevents that NC-terminal interaction of the androgen receptor, and that is necessary for full agonist effects of the androgen receptor. But since it prevents it, but still causes the agonism of the androgen receptor, YK11 is considered as a partial agonist of the androgen receptor. YK11 is anecdotally associated with joint pain and tendon degradation. The tendons of myostatin knockout rats have 20% less peak strain compared to wild-type controls. 
I will go more into this topic in a separate video in a separate series, but TGF beta proteins are very important for the commitment of stem cells toward the fibrotic commitment, the fibrotic lineage, such as scar tissue formation, collagen, fibrin, these things that are associated with connective tissues like the tendons and the ligaments. If you block the majority of TGF beta proteins that are so important for that development of tendons and ligaments by upregulating follistatin by using something like YK11, then you are going to cause a higher risk for injury because the contractile component of the skeletal muscle is going to grow because you're inhibiting myostatin and other TGF beta proteins. But the actual tendon part or the ligament part is going to lose its integrity because TGF beta signaling is important for those guys. So it's a drawback. It's uh, you can increase your muscle mass unlimited theoretically through myostatin inhibition, but if you're going to do it through follistatin, then that in itself is not tissue selective enough. That wraps it up for this series. I hope you guys learned a lot. I sure did in the last two years of researching this topic. And of course, I will keep up with the research and continue to make educational videos because I enjoy to learn about this. And I think it's important that people who are interested in this are understanding what's actually going on. What happens when I go to the gym and train? Why is it that I need to eat so much protein? And why does it take so long to build a muscle? And why do I keep reaching a plateau that I can only break with drugs at, cer at a certain point? I would like to thank my uh, advisor. Uh, advisor is actually plural for this. Dr. McElvain and Dr. Kim from Syracuse University for helping me to develop this paper. And as I said in the first episode, we are working on getting this paper published by early, uh, early next year, 2022. I will add the link to that paper once it's been published down below when it's available. And you guys can go ahead and read that very, very long extensive paper. Please let me know if you guys have any questions, leave it down in the comments and I'll try to respond to them in the best way possible. And that being the scientific way with research. Um, follow me on Instagram at jpark, J-A-Y-P-A-R-Q-E. And I do not condone breaking, drug, breaking the law or using substances to harm your health but people are going to do what they're going to do. So if you are hypothetically considering doing this for a hypothetical friend, <laughs> you might as well learn the science behind it so that you at least have an idea of what you're doing. So amen to that. See you guys later.